Uh, we only have one microphone today, it's only one per room here. But uh, if you don't know me, I'm Tony Russo, I'm the president of the Commerce and Industry Association of New Jersey. I want to first thank all of you for taking time out of your Fridays to come to Kane University. They are one of our members. Uh, Debbie and I actually met with President Ferrari not too long ago. Uh, and if just a, a little bit of side note, if you remember a few years ago, there was that famous conference room table. It's right down the hall on the other side, so you can kind of peek in there. But uh, anyway, I want to again thank uh, uh, the folks here at Kane University. I also want to thank our sponsor today, Michelle from Earl Companies of Pure Soil. Uh, so thank you for sponsoring and underwriting. I think this program, I know Paul's part of our marketing uh, steering committee. Some of you uh, probably get a sense that we have 12 forums. We have a lot of different forums that we do. We have 900 different members from virtually every business sector. Uh, if you take a look at who's in the crowd today, good diversity. Marsha's here, she's one of our manufacturers. Uh, a lot of bankers, attorneys, accountants, uh, environmental consultants. So when we thought about doing this program, and I don't want to take Bill Sr.'s uh, thunder, but we just thought it would be a good idea to put together a program and talk about how to, how to develop sales and, and how to land sales. For, from a personal perspective, I can tell you we're always looking to grow our membership, so I'm looking forward to hearing the panelists and just kind of picking up some tidbits and, and seeing how to land so more members. So without further delay, I'm going to introduce our moderator today, Bill Taylor Sr. He's the founding member of Corporate Ladders. He brings with him 30 years experience in the business community, a great speaker. He, uh, his firm runs a uh, business coach, consultant, you know, help grow businesses. So Bill is going to lead the program today. He's going to introduce our panelists, and then we'll get right into it. So thanks again, everybody. Oh, and I want to thank Debbie and Larry, too, uh, for helping out today. So thank you. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Tony. Good morning. Is everyone ready to go? It's Friday morning. The only standing thing standing between you and the weekend is me, right? So we've got a really good panel this morning, uh, and I want to introduce the panelists for you. But our goal today is to sort of help you uh, get a different understanding about sales, because as we know, sales is the life's blood of every organization. Without sales, where do we go? We may have the very best products, we may have the very best services, but we really need to have clients to come through the door to help us from there. So we're going to spend some time today talking about different aspects of sales, and hopefully that will begin to stimulate some ideas for you in your business. And uh, our goal today is to help you name something, something strong, many, maybe many things strong, that will really help you in your business to, to develop and, and build more sales. Okay? Uh, our format today is that we're going to pose a question to each of the panelists, and have them an give them an opportunity to, to give you their perspective on the answer to that question. And then as we wrap up, uh, at the end of the event, we'll ask for some questions along the way. So if you have the opportunity to have a question, put it down, and we'll try to address some of the questions at the end. Okay? If anyone has a burning question that we really need to explore during the day, we'll do it right away. Okay? That, that's our point. So let me introduce the panelists. So firstly, we've got uh, Michelle Zalisi. Uh, Michelle is the uh, sales account supervisor for Pure Soil and also our sponsor today. Um, and Pure Soil is a soil management and a full service recycling firm. Uh, Michelle manages all aspects of the company's sales and marketing and also environmental compliance. Pure Soil is one of several Earl companies, which includes heavy tra uh, highway traffic, site work, asphalt manufacturing, paving, and transportation. And Michelle also provides business development services as the environmental liaison for all of the Earl companies. So prior to her current position, uh, Michelle also served as an environmental consultant. She has 20 years of environmental consulting experience and regulatory compliance. And also, she has comprehensive knowledge of the local, state, and federal regulatory and compliance environment. Uh, so that's Michelle. She's also a graduate of uh, Stockton University has a degree in environmental science, and she lives in Ocean County. Anybody up from Ocean County? Okay, so we've got somebody from Ocean County. Okay, thank you. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you. And now, next to Michelle, we have Andrew, Andrew Ritchell. Andrew is a graduate of Rutgers and is the founder and president of Electronic Office Systems in Fairfield. Uh, his company has uh, a 35-year-old uh, track record of selling uh, and leasing systems and uh, technology commercial grade laser copier systems, fax and networking equipment, 
and currently serves over 4,000 commercial clients uh, in New Jersey and New York metro area. In addition to serving these local businesses, uh, he also ships to all 50 states and services companies nationwide with their existing network that they've established. Uh, they're also honored as one of the 40 national companies in office equipment industry by the J.D. Power Award Company, uh, rather with the J.D. Power Award, uh, and provide superior services to clients uh, uh, throughout the network. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, at the end over there, we've got Bill Taylor, Jr. I know him pretty well. Uh, and he's director of sales for Corporate Ladders, and specializes in, we specialize in finance and banking, accounting and technology sectors. And Bill has uh, a 10-year experience working with uh, multinational uh, clients in all sorts of different industries. High Achiever has won many performance awards and works extensively with C-level decision makers. Before he joined Corporate Ladders, he was uh, a part of the FINS network, part of the Wall Street Journal and Dow Jones, and was a senior account executive building his book from zero to $2 million in a, in a very short period of time. So. Uh, he's also honored uh, for three consecutive years as the salesperson of the year at Dow Jones. Uh, so welcome, Bill. And then finally, in the middle there, Danny, Danny Wood. Uh, Danny is a sales expert and certified trader for uh, Sandler Training. Helps individuals and business owners and companies to implement proven systems and create a customer-centric sales organization. Now, this is achieved through sales methodology that incorporates training, coaching, and reinforcement based on the psychology of human behavior and continual development. Danny has helped thousands of individuals become proficient with the strategies and techniques and behaviors uh, and beliefs to help them improve the results with their sales efforts. So, Sandler Training dominates the global training market, has been recognized by training industry as one of the top 20 training companies for eight consecutive years. So I think you have a very strong panel here today. Uh, so without any ado, let's get started. First question to our panelists. And what we're going to do here is pass the mic. So, Michelle, I will pass the mic to you first. Thank you. And our first question for the panelists are, uh, as we all know, the economy has rebounded significantly recently. And many businesses have seen improved activities in all different aspects of their business. The question is, what should business owners and sales professionals be thinking about in an improving economy to be able to increase their sales? Great question. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, I think that uh, there's a few things. One is because we were impacted by the economy and a lot of us were in that industry during that time, um, you need to reestablish yourself. Um, so it depends on what type of business that you have, whether you're a service provider, retail, um, if you're a uh, business organization and things of that nature. But typically this is what, what our mindset is and this is what I recommend. So one is you really need to identify your goals. What are our goals? If, uh, if the economy is kind of bouncing back uh, and the, the dollar volume isn't there, okay, well is one of our goals maybe to increase our customer service, increase our territory service maybe? Those would be goals that you would kind of look at to offset maybe the decrease in sales or the decline in sales or something of that nature. Um, then the next thing I would do is once you identify them, set your goals. Okay, well, we have a goal now. Well, what are we gonna do in order to get there? Um, and so kind of set your goals. If we're gonna increase, we wanna increase our customer base, are we gonna increase our territory range? Are we regional? Are we statewide? Are we, you know, are we, do we do work only in New Jersey? Do we do work over 50 states? Are we along the East Coast? So kind of identify that and then establish what, like what type of goals you're gonna to do to move forward. Uh, and then diversify. I wanna see, I've seen in my experience along the way, um, diversification, right? So if you used to be, I used to work with a lot of biz, uh, residential developers, and so when the housing market tanked, so did all their businesses. And so what those companies that supported them, like environmental consulting firms or, or, or um, maybe like wood establishers or things like that, um, okay, we need to diversify, so what are we gonna do? Maybe kind of reestablish what your, uh, what your niche is, what your market niche is. And then work, work with your team to do that as well, move forward. And then you need to adapt, right? That would be my recommendation. So what I've seen over the course of years is that, am I over? There. I was just going to say, what I would do is just kind of adapt to where you may have been in competition with um, someone before, you might be teaming with them to kind of both work together for the greater good for your company. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Michelle. So Andrew, same question. 
What should business owners and sales professionals be thinking about in improving the economy so they can increase their sales? <clears throat> well, if you're speaking about, I don't know if this is working. Everybody hears, can hear me? Yeah. yeah, in improving economy, yes, the economy has improved since 2008. Uh, we watched business from 2007, 2008 tank, and 2009, 2010, 2011, things have gotten better. But I see a slight malaise in the economy right now, and people are a little tentative. So we don't see a bounding economy right now, but it doesn't matter because we're either uh, selling in a booming economy or we're working to sell in whatever economy we're in. And it's keeping the blinders on and focusing on our marketing efforts, our sales efforts, and maintaining our customers and customer relationships, and also getting referrals from our existing customers. So as far as a booming economy, I'm not sure if that is the case, maybe in different parts of the country and in different uh, types of businesses, but in northern New Jersey, which is my primary marketplace, we see the economy being steady but not booming, but it, we still have to work with the same intensity of taking care of clients and going out and finding new prospects. Thank you. Uh, Danny, Yes. same question. All right. Can I have that? Oh, oh yeah. It's not working. All, right. All right, fair enough, and I appreciate it. So, uh, well, thank you very much for uh, having me here. Uh, great question. I think that, um, first of all, I'm well, going to ask the same thing. What's that? It's not turned on. Is it turned on? Is it turned on? Oh, yeah. 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 All yeah. right. Be here in a couple minutes. Okay, fair enough. Anyway, so, you know, I, I do think it's rebounding. I think the economy is rebounding. I think that uh, good people are hard to find. A lot of people are employed. Uh, back in uh, 2007 um, and, and well, prior to, to 2008, uh, you know, a good economy created many sins. I think a lot of lessons have been learned. I think people aren't doing a lot of the things that they, they used to when people were just order takers. I think everybody needs to know now that you don't need order takers. You know, somebody who was in the mortgage business back then and sold to everybody was a good salesperson, but everybody was qualified. And so they really didn't have the skills in order to go and sell in, in, in a competitive environment. And I think right now it's a very competitive environment. What happens in a, in a rebounding economy, so to speak, is that there's a lot more competition. People hang up their shingle. They, they're, there's there's, there's um, smaller companies there's, uh, that, that want to establish themselves, that, that want to uh, gain market share, and maybe there's price competition. So people really need, salespeople really need to be equipped on how to sell against competition. I mean, how, if one more person comes to me and say, price, 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 I mean, that's, that's a person who's not really equipped on how to sell differently. And I, I think sales is a profession, as we all know. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, we have uh, lawyers, accountants, we have people here with, in engineering, a lot of degrees, they've learned their business, but when it comes to sales, what we need to do in, 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 to enable, enable to, in order to uh, sell competitively is to, is to grow our people and give them the skills that they need in order to compete in this, in this environment. Okay, thank you, Dan. Mm -hmm. Bill? Yeah. I want this, it uh, doesn't work, but no, uh, give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. So, um, I think in an improving economy, there are two key things that business owners and business development professionals should be looking for. When the economy starts to get better, the purse strings begin to open up a little bit. So, one of the <coughs> things that we can start to look for are the old prospects that we never were able to bring on board before. So they say you learn a lot more from the clients you lose and the clients that you win sometimes. So any of those clients that you might not have been able to close in the past or bring on board before because of budget issues or because of timing issues, uh, an increasing economy is the ideal time to go back into your Rolodex, your CRM system or whatever you're using and start reaching out to those individuals who didn't come with you for one reason or another. Because now that things are starting to get better, there may be new opportunities to do business with those individuals. So the other thing that we should be on the lookout for are new opportunities. So if the, re if the economy is rebounding, there's usually a reason, right? So whether taxes are going down or whether business is booming or there's more spending going on, what are the reasons why the economy is getting better and how is it impacting your specific industry? And once you know how your specific industry is being impacted, you can start to uncover new opportunities within 
your existing client base, or excuse me, uh, prospect base. So not individuals that you've spoken to previously, but who's rebounding and what's a good opportunity for you to start to do business with them. So if you can identify some of the older prospects that you weren't able to bring on board and you're able to identify some newer prospects that are being positively impacted by the rebound, then you've got yourself a pretty solid mix of companies or individuals that you can start to target to grow your business, to grow your practice, and to start to generate some additional revenue. So always be on the lookout for what are the new opportunities being created and how are they impacting people we weren't able to get in the past and how are they gonna impact new businesses that we can start to market to for the future. Okay, thank you, Bill. Uh, I'm gonna skip now to Andrew and have Andrew uh, address the next question first and we'll, we'll continue to alternate in that direction. So I'm a business owner and I'd like to grow my business. How do I identify the right clients for me? Andrew, can you take that for Yeah, me? identifying the right clients is making a decision who's too small, who's too large, and uh, finding out who is the perfect client size and focusing on getting an an taking an analysis of the population stats of those client potential clients in your marketplace. Um, we do that, we analyze, you know, we, we sell commercial office equipment. So with commercial office equipment, we send a lot of people to Staples and Office Depot to go buy consumer products. We do not go marketing to companies that are not based in northern New Jersey or in middle New Jersey or southern New Jersey. We market to the people in our neighborhood that have their corporate offices there. So we identify who are the clients, the target clients we would like to have. Uh, we take care of our existing clients. We ask for referrals. We ask for entrees into the clients that we would like to have. And uh, for us, we make a decision right up front who we would like to work with who we'd, we'd do a very good job working with, and we focus on those clients, okay. or potential Thank clients. You. Thank you. Uh, Dan, we'll go with you next. Sure, no, I appreciate that, thank you. <clears throat> it's a good question, a very important one, quite frankly, because I find when people are out, uh, sometimes when we're out networking, we're meeting <coughs> new people, and somebody will say, um, you know, who's a good client for you? And if you're in the payroll business, somebody might say, well, anybody who uh, has employees. And it, it's just so broad and we can't think of who we would want to refer, and they really don't know who they want to go after. So we really need to know, in addition to you know, how many employees and company size, volume, these types of things, who do you want to work with? Who is ideal for you? So for, for me, very often, somebody might say, oh, I have a referral for you, and, and I might say, well, that's great, thank you. The ideal client for me, I'll just share so that you can kind of figure this out on your own, is, is somebody who's uh, is a closely held business, entrepreneurial, strong-willed. I might even say that they drive a really nice car, they own their own building, they, or they rent a significant amount of office space, owner drives a nice car, reserve spot, um, cares about their people. So, you know, who, you know, the easiest way to get business is, is through referral. I mean, certainly we could talk about cold calling and prospecting plans and all these things that we, we should be doing as part of our mix. But if you want to grow your business quickly, we have to let people know exactly who it is that is our ideal customer. And that takes a little thought, and uh, we have to be able to explain that uh, pretty well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bill? Yeah. Can you repeat the question for me one more time? Sure. The question is, I'm a business owner and I'd like to grow my business. How do I identify the right clients for me? Yeah, I think... Um, that's a very powerful question, and there's so many different ways that we can go with that. But I think one of the key things is you have to really know your products and your service as well. Because if you don't necessarily know enough about your target Sorry. audience and what it is that you... Try it now. Sorry. Hello? You're on? Is that better? Yeah. Okay, great. So if, if you know what it is that you're bringing to market and you know your ideal clients, you can really start to hone in with a laser-like focus on who is your ideal prospect or candidate. And you have to know enough about their business and their needs. So all too often we hear about business owners or sales professionals talking a lot about what it is that they do. They wanna talk about the bells and whistles and the knobs and buttons of their service or product. But to really truly be successful, we have to actually put ourselves in our client's shoes we have to think about what it is that they need and how we can help service that need. What can we bring to the table 
as the business owner or the sales professional that's going to resonate with them. Because I can tell you about all the terrific features, if none of them are relevant to what it is that you're looking to solve, even if it's the best product or solution on the planet, if it doesn't align properly with what it is that you need, it's a complete waste. Now, that's not to say that they're still not a good prospect, but they're not going to see the value that you're bringing to the table if you're not able to identify what it is that they're looking for. So always be conscious of what our clients' needs are and being able to ask good questions to find out if there are any underlying needs that we're not necessarily aware of, the two key things that we need to always focus on. Okay, thank you, Bill. Michelle, same question. Thank you. Yeah, excellent question, and I want to um, add to what Bill was saying. Uh, you really need to know your product or services, or if you're, um, and so there's a variety of different people in the room. So if you're a business organization, what's your value? Tell me, like if I'm a consumer, or if you're gonna come to me, tell me why I should be part of you. Tell me why I need to be with you. Tell me what value you bring. Um, and so you really do need to know what your product is and know how that product will work with people that you're meeting, maybe networking or prospecting. Also be a, uh, I wanna add one thing I think uh, in business typically, is be a good listener. So if you meet somebody and you think like their company is somebody, like you, and vet them. Uh, anytime I go to a meeting, I always do my due diligence. I look up the client, I look up their company. I know enough about them to know whether or not this product's gonna fit them or this product, or maybe it's not gonna work at all, but you know what, maybe there's some synergy there and some capacity that we could work together. Uh, or it's all about you know word of mouth. So if I, if it's the product needs don't work for that particular client, they might work for the next one or somebody. But be a good listener. It's really important. Uh, and so resonating on what Bill had mentioned as well is that if you if I have these great products and services, but it's not really what you need, then it's kind of like a waste of your time. So be no be cognizant that you can listen to them because if you're talking while they're talking then you're really not listening to them so i think that's one of the de definite key takeaways in sales generally speaking let you tell me about your business when i come in to sell to you i'm going to say tell me about your business tell me what your needs are do you need transportation here's why i'm valuable because i can offer you this disposal and transportation and i can provide asphalt manufacturing for you and all of these other assets so those would be the key takeaways very good Thank you. So, so it, it, it sounds like there are a lot of different ways to attack this. One of the things that, that I was thinking about when I heard the panelists talking was, it's important for you to know what your product is. But it's also important to take a look sometimes at your base of clients. Where have you been successful? And what does the profile look like? So that you can identify what that profile looks like. You might be able to sort of zero in on the best places to go for the future. It may not be an exact match, but it'll give you sort of a range of where to go. Makes sense, right? So now, the next thing that, that comes up all the time, that the next question I have for everyone is being salesy. One of the biggest challenges everyone says to us, uh, boy, I really like to go out there and sell, but I don't want to sound salesy. And as if salesy or sounding salesy is a bad thing. So the question to the panel, and I'll start with Danny today, is how do I go out and sell my products without being salesy. Fair enough. Well, I think you're right. And I think it um, is a bad uh, stigma, let's say, for, for salespeople. I don't, I don't think it, it should be that way. But there's not a lot of people putting their children to bed at night and tucking them in and giving them a kiss on the forehead and saying, study hard in school, honey, and you're going to be a salesperson one day. <laughs> um, he did, but that was a while ago. That's right. Um, yeah. So, um, and it worked out okay for you guys. So that's a good thing. But I, I know it's a, it's a wonderful profession, as I said earlier. Um, you know, the, the key is to, we call it a pattern interrupt, which means interrupt the pattern for what a traditional salesperson would do, say, act like. And so often we say, I can't be that salesperson. You know what? I do sales training, and what we tell people is, don't be a salesperson. Do the opposite. In other words, one of, one of the things that we do when we're selling uh, or even making a call, you know, we might say, hey, hey Bill, Danny Woods, sound the training. Does my name ring a bell? Well, I don't know, Danny, does it? Don't rack your brain. We've never met. I don't even know if we should be speaking. Would it be all right if I took 30 seconds, tell you why I called, and you could tell me, should we even continue the call? And if not, that's okay. So for us, it's being disarmingly honest, being comfortable in your own skin, giving somebody the opportunity to say no. If we were to meet each other and I were to say, thanks for inviting me in, 
Paul, appreciate it. We're still okay on the 45 minutes that we have together. I'm sure you'll have some questions for me. I have some for you. Hey, Paul, by the way, if at any point you realize that our questions and answers just don't match and, and I'm not a fit for you, could you let me know? It's okay to tell me no. And, and if I felt the same way, would it be all right if I share that with you? Because we're not for everyone. Equally as important, Paul, if we think that there is a fit, let's take the last few minutes and figure out how to work together, figure out those steps. Will that be all right? Never deny anybody their right to make a decision. Give them an opportunity to say no. It's called your BYAF, but you're free. It's okay. You don't have to. People like to buy. They don't like to be sold. So my suggestion is to do the opposite of what a traditional salesperson will be, how they behave, and you'll get treated differently than a salesperson. Good. Thank you, Dan. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you. So one of the things that we as sales trainers hear all the time is I don't like it. I don't want to appear salesy. Working with a lot of professional services folks like we do, um, that's probably one of the biggest things that we hear from individuals when it comes down to learning how to be a good salesperson, a good business developer, is that there's always the underlying fear that they're going to appear salesy. One of the things that I think is ideal to making sure that you don't appear salesy is part of what Danny was saying. Be respectful of their time, be respectful of them taking the time to meet with you. But another tremendous part of that is asking good questions. Because if they've agreed to meet with you or if they've taken the time to sit down and speak with you, there's obviously something underlying. People's time is precious and they're not going to spend the time with a sales or business development professional or any professional unless there's some sort of need. So the key is truly to ask good questions. Find out what that need is. What challenges are you faced with? Why did you agree to meet with me today? What are some of the things that you need help with? What are some of the solutions that you're hoping I can bring to the table? And to Michelle's point earlier, listen. Take the time and listen to their answers. So a lot of times we're very quick to start formulating our answers before they've already finished speaking. But if you can take the time and listen to what it is that they need, listen to what it is that they're on the lookout for or how you might be able to help, they're going to tell you everything that they need and you don't need to sell. All you need to do is show them how you can match up with it. If you went into a car dealership, they have that stigma, right? People always say the car salesman, right? A lot of people are nodding their heads. And I apologize if there's any car salesman in the room. I'm not trying to knock them because they, they offer a valuable service. If you were to walk into a car dealership and he was to say to you or she, and they were to say, what brought you in today? What are you looking for? And you were to say, well, I have five kids. I do carpooling. I always have a lot of soccer clothes, hockey clothes. I have gear with me and we do family picnics. And that sales guy brings you to a two-door sports car. He's probably not listening to what you were looking for. But if he's to bring you over and he's to show you the family truckster, the minivan, or the big suburban and show you about how he can help you to fit all of the things that you're looking for, is he being salesy or is he showing you what you were asking for? So taking the time to ask good questions and then listening to their responses before you formulate your own are critical <coughs> to being able to get your point across, show what you have to offer without being salesy towards it. Okay, thanks, Bill. Michelle. So again, I apologize if there are any used car salespeople in the, in the audience or any Avon ladies that I might offend, um, but we all kind of know what the negative connotation is typically with, with regards to sales. But here's my takeaway, right? One is know your product. Really know your product. Know your product inside and out. It doesn't mean you have to give me every specification on your product, but just know it. Know what you're, what you're selling. Two is believe in your product. If you believe in your product, people can, it resonates, right? So they know if I'm selling jewelry, I'm wearing the jewelry. If I have a great, if you know, if I'm a bank and there's a bank on the corner across the way, or if I'm a coffee man, or if I'm a coffee distribution place and there's one right across the street, well, know, know my product, know why that I'm, I have value, know why that you wanna work with me, right? 
establish relationships. Sales is not about sales. It's about establishing relationships. And if you've worked with me in the past, you know that's what I'm huge on, right? Establishing a relationship. It's okay at the end of the day if you know we try to work together and it doesn't work out on that, uh, on that particular project. I'll shake your hand. I'll thank you for your time. And I'll say, well, it didn't work out on this one, but perhaps give me a call on the next one. And eventually, talking about you know establishing your customer base and prospecting, prospecting, sorry, not too, too much coffee this morning. Um, it'll, it'll eventually work. And then the other thing is I never sell, right? I tell people why they want to work with us. Well, here's my value, right? I can offer you um, competitive uh, bundle transportation and disposal services, and here's why. Uh, here's why you might have to drive past two or three of my competitors to get me. I'm a little bit further away, but here's why it's better to work with me, or here's what's a good reason to work with me. Um, so if you're a bank and you know you say, okay, there's lots of banks out there, people are really savvy. Um, it's this thing called the internet, so everybody Googles everything before they come to it, right? Or tell me why I should be part of your business organization when there's maybe like five or five or so on the list when I'm Googling it, right? So know your value. I never ask people to buy something. I tell them why they wanna work with us. Here's why you wanna work with us, right? We've been in the industry a really long time. I own my own assets. Um, if you call me, my staff answers. I can get your approvals right away. So that's how we typically resonate, and that's how we keep from being salesy. Hey, thank you, Michelle. Andrew. Yes, um, I have 11 outside salespeople that go out and sell to our clients and go out and prospect and find new potential clients. But there is a joke in my office that many times the phone calls that come in, the person is asking for, I'm a friend of Andrew's. So my receptionist goes, how is everybody a friend of yours? And I had to explain to her one day that I don't go out to dinner on weekends with these people or go see a movie or go out with their spouses, but these are my business friends. And the key in business is to have people like you, trust you, for you to be knowledgeable, bring to them value, and to give first. I give away a ton of knowledge. I don't only, only give away knowledge to my per prospective clients and my clients for free. I give knowledge and help my competitors out in the marketplace. And my competitors refer me business when they can't do business uh, with a potential client. Um, sales, in general, being a salesperson does have a bad name. Maybe it is from the sleazy used car salesperson. And sales is a great profession. And uh, people who are in sales should be honored to be in the profession as long as they're trained well and uh, they do bring value. And when we're advertising and looking for new salespeople right now, we're not looking for people that have churned from sales job to sales job to sales job. We place ads in the newspapers right now for marketing people, uh, for public relations people, and communications people. And we bring them in and we have them prospect and go out and make appointments and then we go out to the appointments to do introductions to potential clients. And through that process of sharing what our our unique advantages that we can offer the clients or potential clients, we find new business. So for us, um, being a public relations person, being a marketing person or a communications person is somebody we want as a potential true sales professional down the road. Thank you. So a few takeaways, <clears throat> excuse me, a few takeaways, right? One, what we heard was that we should take some time to make sure that we know who we're going to be speaking to beforehand. We need to ask a lot of good questions. A lot of what we heard is asking questions and providing the value to that client, speaking to them in a way that that client believes that you're interested in their needs. Uh, what we also heard was that everyone likes to buy, right? We all like to buy, but we don't like to be sold to, so we don't want to be in a situation where uh, we believe this is something that's being pushed on us versus something that we're being led toward, if it's something that, that makes sense. So, so if we're doing all that, and we have to ask a lot of good questions, and we need to spend time getting a good understanding of our client, uh, it's probably pretty easy to do sales, right? It's probably something quick, uh, or maybe not. So the next question would be, uh, how much time does it take to be a good sales professional? So Bill, I'll, I'll give you that one. How much time does it take to be a good sales professional, to get good at sales? I like to believe I was born with it. <laughs> no, um, it, that's a good question. So how much time does it take to become good? Well, 
It's sort of a loaded question. Uh, how do you <laughs> how do you measure good? Is, is it based on your your target or your goal or your quota? Uh, is it based on your book of business? Is it based on um, how quickly you can close a client? So it's a bit subject uh, subjective to say what is good, but. Um, how long does it take to become a good person, a good sales professional, or a good business developer? Um, I think a big part of that comes down to your desire and your aptitude. So, um, you know, at least myself and Danny, and you know, we wouldn't be working if there weren't people that were trying to get better at sales. Uh, that's our whole purpose for um, waking up every day is to help other people get better at it. I like to believe that everyone has the aptitude to do it. It's really just the amount of desire and the effort that they want to put towards it. Uh, you can teach anyone to be a good sales professional if they want to, to learn, and just like most other skills. If they want to learn how to do it, you can learn how to do it. It's just the amount of time and commitment you want to put towards it. Um, to make somebody or to become a good sales professional, um, if you are responsible for it, and if you're responsible, you have revenue goals, you're responsible for finding and bringing in clients. Once you know, uh, you, you've heard that a few times from, from members here on the panel, you know your product, you know your service, you know what you bring to the table. Uh, so that's really your baseline. So once you know what it is that you're bringing to the table, you can become a good sales professional by taking the time to um, study it. You know, coming, the fact that everyone is in this room today, we like to believe that each of you is working harder to become a better sales professional. And I see folks nodding their heads. So that's a good sign that everyone is looking to grow their business or grow their practice one way or another. Um, you can become better, not overnight, but you can become better in a short period of time if you invest in it, if you really buckle down. So uh, it doesn't take forever. Obviously, the longer you do it, the better you'll become at it like anything else in the world. Um, but even a, a small improvement, the littlest improvement, can have a big impact on your business over time. So. Okay, thanks, Bill. Michelle. Okay. So, yeah, um, just kind of shadowing that, I would say define good, right? So, uh, and there's a lot of different people here with different backgrounds. So one is I, I don't necessarily think, and I have a, a bit of a difference of opinion, I don't think not everybody's good at sales. Uh, I think that you know some people are better at sales than others. I think some people are better at being managers than others. I, you, have to, you have to kind of find your niche, right, and find your fit. Um, do I think I think that if you know your product and you're passionate about it, I think it's helpful. I think if you're a people person, I happen to be a people person. I like people. I like meeting new people. I like learning from people. I like going to events like this. I like. Um, watching other people sell, um, you know, there's definitely takeaways, right? I never say no. In a conversation, I never say no. If somebody says, do you do this? I don't say, no, we don't do this. I say, well, we might not do that, but one of our clients might do that, and I can facilitate, you know, putting you two together. It's all about relationship building, like I mentioned before. So those are, like, some key takeaways. So do I think that people want to be, and it's all about measuring, right? So don't, like I said before, define good, right? So measuring that, does it mean that your revenue increased? Does it mean that your customer base increased? Does it mean that you, you know, increased your company? Does it mean that you went from a 100 uh, person employee firm to 300 person employee firm you have to do it so make always and I recommend smart goals right so specific measurable attainable relevant and timely if you use that mindset when you're establishing your goals you'll always be successful okay, thank you Michelle. Uh, I'm gonna take the micro answer on this versus the macro answer and that is uh, how much time does it take to be successful in a week um, so does it take 20 hours 30 hours 40 hours in a week's time. Um, we find that our salespeople, we request our salespeople to work from eight to five, Monday through Friday. That's our one of our uh, values and um, directions for our salespeople. But realistically, 55 to 60 hours a week is what a good sales professional puts into selling. Um, in that 55 to 60 hours, there is skills training, and we are a big believer that sales training is forever and anything that you know how you have sales skills you learn it but you re go over it again and again and again and you hire sales professionals to come in and work with the sales people to keep retraining and keep going over the sales skills um, but we're also a believer my company has the belief system that 
We want people to work hard, we want them to work smart, and then we want them to have their friends, their hobbies, their personal interests, and balance their life so when they come back into work, they have the energies, they have the excitement, and they have the rest um, to go back in and be a good, powerful salesperson. I have brothers and sisters that work very, very hard. They work 75, 80 hours a week. They have nice homes, they have nice cars, and their companies put ping pong tables in their office, and they put cots there so they can take naps. And their company's belief system is that you are working, you are living to work. Our belief system is that you are working to live, and sales is a very good avenue to be able to make a good living and to be able to provide for your family. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Yeah. Danny? Yeah, all good stuff. I love it. I could listen to other people. You know, when you love sales, you can... You get jazzed by just being around other people, and, and uh, so thank you guys. Good stuff. Uh, Bill mentioned desire. Desire trumps all. I mean, how badly do you want to succeed? Four most important ingredients, desire, commitment. Do you take responsibility? Do you have a good outlook? Commitment. How committed are you to being good at sales? What is commitment? Doing what you said you're going to do, even though the mood you had set it in has passed, even though it's difficult and you're afraid. So if we're going to be successful in sales, you don't have to be on clock time. You could be on goal time. What are the things I need to do to be successful? But we have to come out of our comfort zone. If you want to be successful and you have to call larger companies, people hire in, or in organizations, ask for larger sums of money, um, whatever it is that you may be uncomfortable with is what we need to work on. And, you know, otherwise we get busy with busy work and we do other things and we think we're developing, but we're not. So our philosophy, which seems like it's shared around the table here, is it's like training a sales athlete or a sales musician. You don't, you don't learn a musical instrument in a day. You don't get in shape in a day. It's transformation. It doesn't stop. Derek Jeter had a coach till uh, he retired. Who's helping you to get better and transform? So uh, now, the first thing I thought when I heard this question was, hey, there's people that are in environmental. There are accountants, lawyers. And they're like, hey, I mean, that's just not what I do all day. And I get it. And so you just have to determine what will it take for you, how much time does it take for you to reach your goals, and maybe it's a three-hour commitment a week for business development, right? Maybe it's having lunch with strategic partners and networking at certain places. So, you know, if you have Salesforce like, like you do, I mean, there's, that's, that's their life. That's their, you know what I mean by life, but that's their, that's their business. And if you're in an accounting firm, you've got billable hours, so there's a conflict. You guys know that. So... You know, it's, it's how much time will you need in order to, to, to commit to, but you do have to commit to something and, and do it right and not have the same lunch with the same people, lunch with the same people every week and not kid ourselves because it's about coming through your comfort zone. Okay, thank you. So, so we had a lot of different perspectives there, right? Uh, you know, Bill said that he thinks that anybody could be trained to be a good salesperson. Michelle's perspective was, well, it's important to have that, that ability to be a people person and connect with people. She, she approaches a little bit differently. Uh, we heard Andrew talk more about the fact that he believes that there is a fixed amount of hours, at least, that we should be putting in, yet Danny's perspective was a little different depending upon the industry. So what does that say to us? Everyone's industry is a little bit different. Everyone approaches sales in a different way, but the commitment needs to be there. The key word is the commitment. And being able to do whatever it takes for your business to reach your clients for you to be successful in the way that you've defined success for your business. And one of the things that we see very often is that there is different terminology depending upon a business, depending upon uh, an organization, uh, maybe the, the, the type of clients that they look for. So we see a lot of different challenges in that area. One of the challenges that we see very often is that there's different terminology. So I came from an IBM background. And at IBM, everyone who was at IBM who was a salesperson was called a marketing person. Oh, that's the marketing folks. Well, then my idea of marketing is different. My idea was, well, isn't it marketing what you do when you try to sell, you know, the latest drugs or those types of things on the on the TV? That, that's a little different. So, so there there is this this essential discussion about is it is that sales? Is it marketing like IBM called it? Uh, but yet lately we've been hearing about something else called what business development. You know that we're doing business development work. 
So are they the same or are they different? Is there any difference between sales and marketing and business development? Is it just a different way of saying it? How do we approach that? So um, start with Michelle, right? The, the next person. So Michelle, take that for us. What's the difference? Is there a difference between sales, marketing, and business development? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think that business development, in my opinion, is prospecting and identifying potential clients or companies that you want to do business with. Um, sales is actually implementing that, closing the deal, making the deals, making it work, kind of, you know, um, be, providing support to existing clients, right? So you want to keep new, you want to generate new business, you want to prospect. Uh, you want to do new sales, but you want to also keep that book of business going, right? Because like anything else, it's all about your established relationships. You want that repeat business, those type of things. Um, with regard to marketing, I feel like that you market yourself all the time. So even if you're not a salesperson, say you're uh, an environmental consultant or an attorney, when you go out to events, you're, you're constantly marketing yourself. Um, and so with that, I, I think that they're, it's all um, connected. Uh, but I do think there's a little bit of a difference. And then you have to define what your goal is and what your role is uh, in your company and what you're looking to, to do moving forward. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have company meetings three times a year where we have everybody in the company come to a meeting and we go over our weaknesses, strengths, opportunities, and threats, and we go through the news in the marketplace and how the company is doing, and we share numbers with all the employees. However, um, I have drivers, I have admin people, I have accounting people, I have sales people, service people, IT people, and everyone in the company is given the task of being a salesperson, a marketing person, a public relations person, and they are all given the challenge to build relationships, find new prospects, retain customers, keep customers happy, and they don't have the end role of going out and selling systems. They refer to the sales department that goes out and sells new systems uh, to clients. But every single person in the company, including myself, is a sales, marketing, public relations person. OK, good. Thank you. Thank you. Danny. Yes, sir, I find that business development and sales are actually the same thing. Uh, marketing, on the other hand, you know, creating awareness, uh, especially these days, inside sales, uh, excuse me, uh, inbound marketing and so forth. I mean, marketing to me is, is, is a bit different. Creating awareness, getting people to have a conversation with, uh, in certain cases, call to action. So that's what I consider marketing. But with business, and business development and sales, what I find is that the professional firms don't love the word sales or didn't love the word sales. And so I find that I get uh, called into organizations and they say, hey, look, you know, for our people, you know, we've got a firm here. We're going to call it business development. We need to sell, but uh, don't say that there, right? Uh, because, uh, you know, they didn't, they, didn't go, they didn't go to college to, to sell. That's not what they want to do, you know. Now, now, when we get started and we close the doors and everybody's in already and they lock it, they say, hey, guys, we brought this guy in because we've got to sell stuff, Right? And so, you know, we start to really use the, the word sales. And as you know, our, our, our approach, everybody's here, is, is not salesy. So um, I also find that when I share with organizations that, hey, you know, we have content that's business development, you know, you don't have to do sales. You know, you're talking banks. I, I don't want, give me the sales stuff. I mean, essentially, it's, it's what people know. That's what you need to do to keep the lights on and then and, and, and grow the organization. So uh, to me, they're one and the same. And uh, the way, it, I, I think it's how you present it to people to get them to uh, feel comfortable with business development. And um, I know in firms and things, that we, we, you're doing marketing now, you know. So marketing, in that case, would be business development. Okay, thank you. Bill. Well, uh, might not be the most popular answer, but I, I draw somewhat of a distinction between the three. Um, so I would say that each of them is unique. Now, if you want to tell um, someone that they have to go out and do some business development, they'll say, oh, okay, that doesn't sound bad. And if you tell them that they got to go out and start selling, they're going to start slowly backing towards the door looking to leave. So um, while they are used synonymous with one another, um, the, I'll, I'll draw one or two distinctions. Hopefully everyone will be able to, to understand. I think we all agree marketing is pretty much 
um, similar. We're all going to have a similar definition of marketing. It's the brand awareness. It's the website. It's the brochures. It's sponsoring events. It's sending out mailers. Uh, it's running advertisements and commercials. Marketing is all of the things that create awareness of your brand, of who you are. Going out to a networking event and you're handing out your business card. Is that sales? Is it business development? Are you personal marketing? So what is it that you're doing when you're going to an event like this one? You know, this morning people are passing business cards back and forth. So if you're building awareness of your brand, there, you don't know if there's a need out there yet. And you don't know if this person in front of you is a particular prospect. Right now, I think you're marketing. I think that you're just doing some discovery. You're trying to make them aware of who you are. Sales, on the other hand, is the end of the spectrum. So if marketing is the beginning of the spectrum, it's creating the awareness. Sales is the end of the spectrum. Sales is getting the engagement, closing the deal, signing the contract, getting that commitment, that offer letter, whatever it may be. Business development is the bridge. So business development is what brings you from marketing to closing, to selling. That's the lunch meetings. That's the meeting at, at happy hour. That's the going out and golfing together. So a lot of that time is not spent closing. A lot of that time is not spent talking about your specific offering, your product, your service. So. The beginning is the marketing creating awareness, the end is the sell, getting the deal done, and business development is everything that bridges that gap in between. Okay, thank you. So we've got a couple different perspectives here, right? What we've heard uh, is that it's a process to some degree. Marketing, generally everyone agrees, it's building the, the awareness, the brand, so that when someone says, hey, I'm from uh, the bank or I'm from marketing company or I'm from the law firm or from wherever whatever business you're from there's a recognition oh yeah I've heard that name I may not know everything about you but there's a little bit of recognition of what that might be or uh, you know somewhere along the lines now somehow you've got to tell me more and bring that along so uh, and then of course business development sometimes is synonymous with sales in some industries they're they're really doing one and the same typically what we see where business development and sales are the same is more sometimes in a, in a more compressed time cycle where something is going to happen more quickly, a more transactional sale versus a, a longer term uh, engagement sale. So we see those differences. Now one of the challenges that we have is to try to determine where we are and how do we sell and what do we do. Uh, so the next question for the panelists then is how important is it to have a sales funnel or a sales pipeline to manage your business? and uh, how does a business use a pipeline when they have one? So we started with Michelle, so we'll start with Andrew. Well, you got to define what you want. Do you want customers or do you want clients? Uh, customers can be transactional. You sell them once and they go away. But we want clients. We want people that we'll, we will have long-term relationships with. I have clients that have been doing business with my company 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35 years. And they are very important for us. A client, when we sell something, we, we talk about our, we don't use the pipeline, but the pipeline is synonymous with the sales funnel. So if our average sale is once every five years on a particular piece of equipment, and sometimes we have clients that have hundreds of pieces of equipment and leases, it comes out the bottom of the funnel, it goes right into the top of the funnel. And they work their way down until the next time we have to replace that equipment. So the funnel or the process of retaining clients is ongoing and forever. Prospecting and finding new potential clients to put into the funnel and whether we're working with client or potential client five years, four years, three years, two years, one year, 120 days, 90 days, 30 days, we track where people are coming down through the funnel. We use a contact management software that interfaces with our CRM software, and we track phone calls, visits, letters, emails, conversations, and we put into our contact management system, when do we have to get back in touch with these people? What were the conversations? And we work to build long-term relationships and keep clients, uh, not just do transactional one-time business uh, pieces. 
Thank you. Danny. Yeah, thank you. Sure. So a funnel is very important. Um, a pipeline, we, might, we refer to it in this case as our, our pipeline. <coughs> I think the, pipe, the thing with this is that you need to be honest with yourself and your organization. And you have to put the right stuff in the pipeline. What are these opportunities that you have in there? And, and uh, maybe we'll get to, at a certain point, talk about sales process. But you have to know where you are in your sales process. What's the likelihood that this sale is going to close and when? And what I find is in a lot of organizations, when they don't know how to qualify, a lot of people have what we call happy ears. Man, that was a great meeting. They loved me. You know, I'm in the relationship business, so we had a great meeting. They love me. I'm going to go back. I'm going to put it in the funnel, and things are going to sit up there with these, these unrealistic numbers of what's really going to close. I don't mean to be so negative. This is what I find. Because I think what, what, if, you're, if you're qualifying honestly, you're going to put the right stuff in the funnel. When you have your right stuff, the right stuff that you believe, high percentage chance, high probability that's going to close, you can sleep at night. What we need to do as salespeople is work diligently to create the opportunities to put, get the right stuff in the pipeline. If we don't work diligently and we are not honest with ourselves, we will take everything and stick it in the pipeline and say, wow, it looks like something's going to close here. Companies, owners, they buy inventory based on that. They hire people based on your pipeline. They get loans. They go to banks based on what their pipeline. It has to be a, an honest pipeline of what we believe is going to close and you can hang your hat on your pipeline and we have to go out and if it's empty by the way we talked earlier I started this whole thing with competition and talking about price pressure when your pipeline is lean we're, we're we have no confidence we have we have you know when buyers say to you hey we're gonna see three five other people all of a sudden they have the leverage oh I mean, three five other people I better start checking my price <laughs> Right? But if I have a robust pipeline with the right stuff that I know is going to close, I can stand tall, ask the tough questions, and close more business. So the pipeline is huge. It just ha we just have to be honest with ourselves. Good. Thanks, Danny. Mm -hmm. Dale? Uh, I, I would say I agree with everybody here. Uh, having a, a pipeline is critical. It may not be overly popular with some of the professional services businesses out there. It's usually more synonymous with true sales professionals. But um, I guess there's a saying, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So if you don't know what's coming in, how are you going to know what's going to be coming out? Um, and much to Danny's point, you have to be realistic with yourself. Not everyone that you meet and collect a business card from is going to go into your pipeline. Not everyone is going to be an ideal prospect for you. So the idea is that if you have a functioning, working sales funnel or sales pipeline, um, you can make sure that you're going to get quality from it. Um, the other saying is garbage in yields garbage out. So if you're putting that in there and it's not a legit opportunity, it's not going to magically become one despite your best efforts. So being honest with yourself, making sure that what you do put into your pipeline, what you do put into your sales funnel, and every business can have a different sales funnel, but there's two key factors. You gotta put something into it, and the something's gotta come out of it, right? So being able to make sure that you have that, and whatever your qualifications are, they're gonna vary for each business. But if you're not measuring, and you're not tracking what it is that you're doing on a regular basis, how are you going to know that you're successful? How are you going to know when you're going to be successful? If you don't know how long it's going to take for that deal to get closed, if you don't know how long it's going to take uh, to bring somebody on board, sign a new engagement, you're going to have no idea how successful you're going to be and how long it's going to take for you to get there. So being able to measure is critical. And in order to be able to measure, you need to have some sort of funnel or pipeline that you can uh, manage and measure. Okay, thank you. Michelle? So my industry's a little bit different. So when I saw the question or I heard the question, I was like, okay, the funnel and the pipeline, it's applicable, sometimes it's not applicable. So I just tried to dumb it down, right, to fit my needs. So here are a couple takeaways. One is um, you, you need a lot of business, right, or to, to get, so I kind of pictured it as a system, a funnel, so those people who aren't necessarily completely sales driven, 
um, I, I try to kind of like a takeaway. So funnel, you need to get a lot of prospects. So here's how, I used to do home-based jewelry sales because I really like jewelry. Um, and so I would tell my, uh, my people, I would say, listen, if you wanna have a successful jewelry party uh, and you want, I recommend invite 30 people. They're like, oh my gosh, 30 people. I'm like, listen, if you invite 30, 10 will come. Just like if you wanna go, if you wanna do um, demonstrations, if you call 100 people, you might get 10 or 20 of them, right? So you, that, that funnel, throw a lot in there and a little bit will trickle out. So it's just like the same that's synonymous with the, after, you know, uh, it takes 20, 20 no's to get one yes, or it takes 10 no's to get one yes, or it takes 30 no's to get one yes. But then, and then put them into your pipeline and kind of know where you're going. But at the end of the day, it's back to the SMART goals, right? The SMART, me so, uh, be specific, <coughs> measurable, like, like Bill had mentioned as well, um, going back. But, at the end of the day, the pipeline, you have to close the deal. So you can meet with 100 people, you can meet with 1,000 people, depending on what your genre is. But at the end of the day, if you're not getting anything out of it, you need to maybe revisit what you're putting in, right? Garbage in, garbage out, we all hear that. But kind of, so you might need to take a step back and say, what am I doing here? You know, what, maybe I need a different perspective. Maybe I need to start prospecting prospecting a different group. Maybe I start to need to look at different sales approaches. Um, so that's just kind of my quick takeaway on that. Very good, thank you. So we heard a lot of different uh, aspects there in, in that question. What, one of the things we heard was that in Andrew's case, his business really manages that flow of business and they know everything that's going on with every piece of equipment, with every client and keeping track of that along the way. So that's a very positive and very powerful way keep track of lease expirations, who's a, a good potential prospect for a renewal, maybe a new piece of equipment coming up. Uh, Danny talked more about uh, making sure that, that, that we're involved with those clients and, and know where we are. We've got to have that, that pipeline, as Bill said, as well. Uh, and then we talked a, a little bit, we heard about the, the garbage in, garbage out, which I'm sure you've all heard about. I have a question for you that sort of popped out. I got a question quickly for the audience. How many of you have ever gone out to lunch with a prospective client? Okay. Uh, how many of you have gone out to lunch with that prospective client a second time? Well, how about a third? Keep your hand up. Or a fourth. And the last question is, that didn't result in business for you. Yeah. So those people is what I always call professional entertainers. Okay. Whatever you want to do, they're with you. You want to go to lunch? Sure. How about a drink? <coughs> yes. What time? Where do you want me to be? Uh, I have tickets to a game. What game? What, what gear should I wear? Should I wear my hat? Should I wear my jersey? What should I wear? Professional entertainers. And we sometimes get professional entertainers in that funnel, in the pipeline. And it's important to understand that I have a professional entertainer in there, and I've got to get them out. Because if I keep that professional entertainer in there, they do a couple things. One, they take a lot of my time. They're willing to go, but Danny said, you know what? This is never going to be business. It's never going to be business for me. And I've got to think about ways to make sure that I maximize my time. So one way to effectively manage your pipeline, which I want to make sure we, we, we leave with, or your, your funnel, <clears throat> always remove professional entertainers because they kind of cloud up <coughs> your funnel and make it difficult for you to get good quality at the bottom. And it's important also, we have to be with a, with a good pipeline we have to track it. How do we know if the pipeline we're working with is effective? How do we track the sales effectiveness of a pipeline? So, so that's our next question. How do we track our effectiveness? What, what do we do to get there? So we started with Andrew, I think, right? So Danny. Sure. I'm going to say that we have to have a, a, I'm going to just blend this a little bit and say we have to have a selling system. You have to have a process, a process that has certain steps to it. And I find very often when I meet with owners of company and, and companies and I ask them if your sales folks were to write down a, on a piece of paper what their sales process would be, well, would they all write the same thing? And they typically say, I don't, I don't know what you mean by a process. Like, you know, somebody goes to lunch, somebody sends a letter, somebody plays golf. I mean, is that what you mean? Oh, you mean Salesforce? Yeah, we use Salesforce. No, I'm, I'm talking about a process. What's the step-by-step? -step? How do you bond and build rapport with somebody? How do you set the expectations? How do you understand their needs, get their pain? How do you get their commitment? You know, there's a process, step-by-step -step process. So if you have a process, you're able to see when you go to your funnel and you're going to put something in your CRM, you can simply say what process you're in. 
and you have to have the right information to put into the CRM or on your spreadsheet to know what are the chances that I will be closing this. And if you don't have that information, then you have to go back and get the information. And that's called qualifying. And you want to make sure that you're qualifying for the, the needs that they have, the pains, you've identified their pains. What pain? If you're putting something in and nobody has pain, you know, then, then you know, that, the chances of that are closing aren't, aren't very, very good. Um, if they don't have the money and they haven't shared it with you and how much they've only able to spend and I haven't been able to figure that out or we're together trying to work on that, my chances are lower of closing the sale. If I don't understand their decision process or their timeline for when they want to close, my chances are even less. So why would I put some of those things in? So to manage your pipeline, you want to, and I like the idea of, of the jewelry, of, uh, you know, you, you want to put a, get a lot, of, lot of opportunities and then figure out which ones are going to go into the funnel, which ones have the opportunity to close. Okay. Being honest with ourselves. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, Bill? Yeah. So, um, sales professionals in certain industries or business development, marketing professionals, any professionals, there, there should be a process involved um, to be able to obviously measure and understand back to the pipeline question. So they're tied pretty closely together, but um, that process is going to vary for each individual and it's going to vary depending on the business, the industry, the type of client, uh, the ticket of the item that it is, or the type of service that it is. So um, there's some businesses out there that their process <coughs> is one meeting, one close, depending on how demanding that need is. There are other people that may take several meetings and, and several different phone calls and several different touch points before you can turn that around. So um, being able to know your business, know your solution, your product, your service is critical. Um, and then only then can you start to really develop a process. And the other thing is if you don't have a process and you win, how do you replicate that? If you don't have a process and you lose, how do you make sure that you don't replicate that? So being able to know your process, tweak and adjust it to make sure that you're getting the maximum efficacy from it um, is, is really important to be able to measure where you are and how successful you're going to be. So I would say there's no right and wrong process for everybody, but having a process is something that we should all strive to do and we can make adjustments and we can tweak it from there. But um, being able to learn from your wins and learn from your losses is one way that you can make sure you're gonna to continue to be successful. But how do you know if you don't know where you are in the process? So being able to have a good solid process is critical. Okay, thank you. Michelle? Great, thank you. So our business model is a little bit different. Um, and these are all really great takeaways. So one about going back to the process, right? It, for us, it goes back to establishing goals, right? Establishing SMART goals. And I'll reiterate that. Specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. So if we put that, oh, those are our goals, then typically I can use all of the <coughs> other tools to uh, track my sales efficiency in business. And so typically what we do is I establish, you know, monthly reports. I know whether or not, you know, financially we're on track with where my goals are being met. Um, I, what our customer base is, if we have continuous client um, turnaround or whether or not our clients are continuing to, to do business with us. So our measuring is a little bit different, but those are the kind of takeaways that I, I would go to. So we look at monthly reports, we look at are we closing the deals, uh, and we look at um, our customer re repetition with projects coming in and then expanding our services. Okay, thank you. Andrew. Yeah, um, uh, the average tenure of an employee in my company is 18 years, so we like to think that we've learned a lot by experiences and what works and doesn't work. and cookie cutter process, um, can it work? I, I don't know, not in my business. We kind of have an adaptive cookie cutter process. So depending on the customer and depending on the prospect, we do have a process and we adapt to the people that we're meeting with and working with. Um, the chains of businesses that are out there, the fastest growing companies that I see, they seem to have a very 
uh, strong process and description of the process and their success comes by replicating their processes. So I'm a big believer in having good uh, honed practices from experience and what works and what doesn't work. And uh, we, anything that doesn't work, of course, we try and toss as soon as possible. Okay, so, so we've heard a couple different perspectives there. Uh, I, I think we've heard that in, in Michelle's case, it's, it's, a, it's a different type of process. It's more of sort of a reporting using smart goals and that. Andrew's got a modified cookie cutter. I like that. Interesting, right? Uh, and Bill and Danny said that there's something else. So, so I want to just f expand on that for a second to each of you. Sort of, I'm going to freewheel it with you. Uh, if there are steps to a process, <coughs> can you bring that down to just a couple of steps so that those that are here today could, could say, well, what are the two or three or four step parts of this process that I should look at when I begin to think about this. So I'll leave it open. Anyone want to want to take that? Uh, you know, what, what are those those three or four things that I might want to think about in the sales process? Are you no, no, ready to roll? You all geared up. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, so the three or four things to to make it into the process is um, you have to be able to identify prospects. I think is is critical. We have to make sure that we know who we're targeting. We have to know who is good for our business. So the identification stage, that's usually at the forefront, that's usually in the very beginning. Um, then we wanna get on to um, qualifying. So we can do as much pre-qualifying as we possibly can. Um, there's places where you can learn where others do business, what are some of the products or services that they're already purchasing. Um, it's not always difficult to find out if they're working with a competitor of yours or something along those lines, so qualifying them. Um, and then making sure that they fit your business or they fit you as a customer base, and then you would fit them. So uh, that also goes along with the qualifying. And then once you have the ideal prospect, how am I gonna reach them? How am I gonna target them? So for some businesses, it might be a cold call. For other businesses, it might be getting a LinkedIn introduction. It might be going out to breakfast, meeting them at a golf outing, or just plain old stalking them. So whatever works for you, figure out a way to get in front of them, right? Um, and then the rest of the process will take place. So after you have that introductory meeting, do you do some sort of demo or demonstration? Do you send them uh, or do you respond to some sort of RFP? Do you have to get on some sort of preferred vendor list? So whatever it may be, figure out what your process is. It's gonna vary for everybody. Um, but then you get into your closing and then tail end is set yourself up for repeat business form from them. Okay, good. Yeah, good. Danny. Okay. Yeah, sure, thanks. So. I'll say uh, the first thing, pre-funnel, pre, it's not even in the sales process, but I would say from a prospecting perspective, we all need to have what we call a cookbook. If you wanted to go out and make, uh, bake the perfect chocolate cake, we'd open up, uh, we'd take a look at a recipe and we'd say, well, these are the things, these are the ingredients that I need to put in there to have the chocolate cake. And lo and behold, after you follow all that, you're going to have the perfect chocolate cake. So we need to have our cookbook for the perfect business that we want, for the amount of prospects that we want in our funnel. We have to, we, and be disciplined enough to do that consistently. But then when we get into the sales process, it's really about what's your, tr what's your process, bonding and building rapport, what's your process for building trust with another human being? Can you identify that? And I find that most people say, well, yeah, I go into your office or I find something in common. You know, I would suggest that that's a way of breaking the ice, but that's not necessarily creating trust. So we really need to know the advanced communication skills on how we're going to differentiate ourselves from everybody else that's going in there. And complimenting, you know, the Yankees or the, you know, the, a, a picture on the wall or whatever puts us in the same box. As it doesn't interrupt the pattern. We sound like everybody else. And we think we're making friends. But, you know, good, good salespeople make friends. But not everybody that makes friends are good salespeople. So, um, and I'm talking about repeat business and everything as well. But, so we, we, need, to, we need to first have that, that strategy for how do we de develop trust with another human being. We have to set the ground rules for what the meeting is going to, how long it's going to take and the agenda and so forth and give the opportunity to say no and what the next steps are. But we really need to be good at getting pain. And really, what is pain? Personal, compelling, emotional reasons as to why that prospect would need to do business with you. And if they don't have that, then I'm, I'm going to suggest that why would we spend time putting proposals together? And why would we spend time sending quotes and taking hopium and hoping? A lot of my clients, before we meet, we, they take hopium. Man, that thing's going to come through. I'm hoping, right? Again, it comes back to being real, but what are the pains? Are they willing and able to, committed to fixing the pain 
And are they willing and able to pay for that and invest in that to get rid of it? And, and there, there are other steps as well. But closing is at the end, by the way. Closing is, is, is we, we qualify hard and close easy. We don't qualify easy and then become that hard closer. And then you end up being like everybody else. So it's the art of mutual agreement, uh, setting the stage, helping. You know, we're all doctors of our business. We need to ask the right questions. And we need to, to, uh, to, to help more people. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Andrew. I thought I had a balance from some of the shorter questions I had. Right <laughs> yeah. Well, first off, we have three different processes. So the first prospect, uh, process is a suspect process. So a suspect process is somebody that we've made contact with. Um, we're not sure if they are going to become a prospect or a future client. So we do our research. Um, we give an intro on the company. Uh, the intro on the company is kind of like a commercial. We are talking about our unique selling, ad unique advantages over our competition and what we do differently in the marketplace. Uh, we build rapport and we fact find. Um, our prospect, uh, when we have a process, our process for a prospect is we research, we go to their website, we find out, we go to the news articles and we read everything about the uh, potential client. Uh, we give a great introduction, uh, we qualify, and we present. Um, a client, we research our clients. We review what we've done in the past with our clients. We resell the company, and this is one of the key things that my salespeople, I have to remind them to do. You have a client that you've had for five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. You can't be presumptuous that they are going to remain your client you can just, a lot of them assume, well, they've been a client for a long time, we're just gonna go in and get them as clients again. Well, if they do that, when some new trained salesperson for a competitor goes in there and they're all excited about their company and they tell all these things that their new company does, a prospect or customer might say, well, this guy's all excited about his new company and all these things that they're doing over there sounds exciting where my salesperson that's been selling to me for the last 12, 15, 20 years, they're just assuming the business. I'm going with the new person. So for us, we resell the company even when we're going into a customer, a customer of, or a client of a long, long time relationship. And we then qualify and then we present. So that's our three different processes. Good, thank you. Thank you. Michelle? So, uh, the business that we're in, so when I'm selling soil disposal um, services and things like that, we have a, a few like different baskets. So one of them would be like our long-term, you know, uh, long-term clients kind of like just out there like, okay, when you guys have a project come up, give us a call. Here's our, these are the services we can provide. Uh, and we do that very well. But then we also have this like, we do a lot of uh, contract bidding. So sometimes I'll get a call, and of course, everybody needed something yesterday. I'm sure everybody in this room has gotten a call like, oh my gosh, we're bidding this job, or oh my gosh, I need this, or oh my gosh, my copier broke, or oh, I need it yesterday. And so what we do is when we talk about a process of kind of like defining really what the need is there, I'll, we'll kind of qualify it. Say, okay, are you bidding this project or do you own the project? Because that could make a difference, right? Where I put my time, right? Because my time is valuable, just like your time is valuable. Um, so do you guys own it? Uh, are you bidding it? Are you bidding it as a prime? Are you bidding it as a subcontractor? Are you, you know, are you getting numbers from other people? I ask those questions. Worst case, they're not gonna tell me, but they might say, yeah, I asked you know, three of your competitors, this one, this one, this one, for pricing as well. Okay, so then I kind of know where I need to be at in that industry or you know, in that pricing range to, in order to be uh, responsive. So I kind of qualify that on the short term because a lot of those things uh, turn around very quickly. Uh, and so with our repeat customers, when they call with those scenarios, I kind of already know what to expect and I know how to handle them. Um, and so that's kind of the process for us, <coughs> like on those specific things. So there's kind of different buckets and silos and depending on what situation I'm in at the time is how I might react or process that particular uh, client. Okay, thank you. So a lot of different uh, perspectives there, right? We saw a lot of different ways uh, one, of the, one of the things we're hearing is that we can sort of put a process together, even though it varies depending upon the business. And uh, a couple of takeaways for sure. Andrew said, uh, I thought quite good, you yeah, always have to resell the business, even if you have the client. Keep it fresh in front of them, why they do business with you, why they should continue to do business with you, uh, as they have all along. Lest someone come in 
with a greater or newer story uh, and maybe suddenly make you look like, well, you've got a great old relationship, but doesn't quite have the pizzazz it had before. Uh, I heard qualifying come up. How important do you think qualifying is? Because you only have so much time in the day. You know, one might argue that <coughs> the most precious commodity you have in business is time. And it's the great leveler for everyone. Because we all have exactly the same amount of time. So if we spend our time on a prospect that we believe could be a client for us, but we didn't do a good job in identifying whether or not that, that prospect has the, the interest, real interest, or maybe has budget, or uh, really has a need, or timing, if, if they're not going to make a decision now, or if it's part of a committee, it all impacts the way we determine that process to be. So it's very important to have a process. So if time is a really important value to us in our business to be effective and have uh, the ability to spend our time wisely, when we talk with prospective clients and existing clients, one of the things that's important is that we have to, I think, build value with a client. So if we have to build value, and value is important then, uh, I'd like to ask the panel then, uh, you know, in your business, how important is a value proposition? How do you get uh, a prospective client, and even in some cases an existing client, maybe you want to do additional business with? How do you, you use a value proposition, and how does that differentiate you from your competition? So uh, I think we started with uh, Bill. So who? Michelle's first. Michelle's first. Okay, okay. thank you. So, Establishing value. Uh, there's a couple things. So I'm trying to think of our industry uh, and how I establish value, but also in the industries like retail and business and business groups and organizations. Um, so establishing value for us would be kind of um, providing <coughs> those kind of key services. And it's almost like, so going back to the other genres, it's kind of like upselling, right? You want to, um, you know, that's why at Starbucks now they have, you know, granola bars and all those. Other, you're upselling. You're constantly providing other services. When you provide office equipment, now you can provide service contracts for that too. So you're constantly servicing your clients. It's kind of that one-stop shopping um, because people love that. One is we, our, our time is valuable. Two is we don't really have a lot of it. So I know myself as a consumer, if I'm buying something, I want to be able to go to one location and get all the service needs that, uh, that I'm looking for. So for us, for when uh, I'm working with Pure Soil, the Earl companies, the value I have is that we own our own companies. I have my own assets. I have control over that. So I can offer you great competitive pricing I can offer you great uh, collective services. I know on our transportation, when I do my own trucking, I have GPS units on all our trucks, and I know if you call me that I can have my staff look and find out where those trucks are for you. And so what that does is that it makes your project more efficient. So that's our value there. Uh, and as for upselling with all the other scope of services, uh, I think it's beneficial. I think that's what clients are looking for. They kind of you know, want that one-stop shopping. So that, that would be the recommendation. Those would be things, services that I would look to, to provide uh, and be good at them too. Thank you. Andrew. Uh, <clears throat> when we talk about value proposition, uh, a lot of times what we're really talking about is what is our 15 second elevator speech? Well, we don't have a 15 second elevator speech. As a matter of fact, in the last sales meeting, we had each of the salespeople write down their 25 second elevator speech and then get up and recite it because we want to make sure everybody is giving the same introduction when they are being introduced to somebody and they're asked, hey, what do you do? But our value statement is actually our unique advantages. We have 24 unique advantages that are unique and distinct from our competitors. And when we go in to meet with a suspect or a prospect or a customer, we, re we go through our unique advantages. Now the problem is that a lot of times you can't go through 24, so what you do is identify what are going to be the key things that you're going to share with the client or prospective client on what separates you from your competition. And we paint a mental picture of what does it mean to them. And in Danny's case, we point out how do we alleviate pain that we know they have or everybody has uh, in business. Uh, calling a telephone number and having a phone chain that you can't get through to a live person and then try and go through a directory to find the name of somebody just to get somebody live on the phone. Big pain. We address that. We talk about our live operator answering the telephone and no, our no voicemail slamming policy. So we go through 
as many of those unique advantages as possible. However, it was a problem. Time is everything. And what we did was we then created a brochure with lots of pictures. And when they say a picture is worth a thousand words, we wanted those pictures to give off a thousand words and then to deduct from the amount of time we needed to spend on our unique advantages setting us apart. I have in northern New Jersey 65 competitors. In the town of Fairfield where I'm at, I have seven competitors. In a five mile radius, I have 24. Every cell we make, we are beating out one, two, three, or four competitors. We have to be good at what we do. We have to sell our unique advantages, and then we have to follow through and provide what we say we're going to do. Good. Very nice. I just want to take a moment and share, because I'm the one, I'm hearing a lot about account management, about, about repeat sales, and treating your customer <coughs> right, and I'm certainly all for that. I mean, I have clients for years. But sales is the lifeblood of every business, and I don't want everybody to, or not that you are, but my, my concern is that there's a difference between being a good account manager and being a salesperson. <laughs> and I think, you know, if you're gonna bring on somebody and say from another company, and they were great account managers, and they had a book, big book of business, and then we're gonna say, well, how come they're not selling anything? Well, it's because they have a very good account management skill set. So, you know, th there, there's a difference, and I think that you wanna have both. You don't want to just sell something and then let it go, but you know, the, I think in your pipeline you're going to want to have uh, new sales and you can have repeat business sales. But if you have so much repeat business sales, you don't concentrate on, on the new sales. And somebody's best pro your best customer is somebody else's best prospect that we just determined. So you know, we, we have to be working both ends. But 30-second um, commercial, I mean, to me that's the value proposition, and, and I think you, you need to know what the pains are that your customers experience. And you, you gotta get pain without being the pain. And it takes time to understand what those issues are that you help people with. So um, I think a well rehearsed, you don't have to be canned, you don't have to be robotic, but I think a well thought out 30 second commercial where you can share with someone. I've gotta tell you, the, the Commerce and Industry Association meeting I had, I went to the, the, the big, um, the luncheon, you know, in October and uh, years ago and, and parked far away and, and uh, walked with a guy and I said, well, I guess we better start networking. And, and, and he, I said, what do you do? He goes, well, I do this, that, and the other thing. It was an insurance company. And he said, what do you do? And I said, well, insurance company. I said, well, I, I do sales training and, and you know, I work with successful companies. They're growing year after year, but for whatever reason, the owner of the company is, is frustrated that they don't have enough new opportunities on a consistent basis or Maybe they're concerned because they have a veteran sales force that make out quotes and proposals, but they don't close the business. Everybody's satisfied with what they have. Or maybe everything's price, 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 and they're, they're just, their business has been commoditized and people can't tell the difference. But you are a very successful company. I can't imagine that would even happen in your world. Oh, what are you kidding? It happens to me every day. So, you know, I don't go into features and benefits about value and what we can help. I try and help people with their pain. And then, as we've said here, Give the solution to that. Good. Mm -hmm. Good. Very good. Billy. <coughs> uh, I think all the answers were, were terrific, and um, I'm going to put a, a slightly different twist on it. So the elevator pitch is obviously a critical part of your value proposition, but um, maybe not everyone in the room has an elevator pitch. So uh, I believe there are three key elements to putting together a good value proposition and making sure that you can quickly capture the attention of whoever it is that you may be talking to. Um, the first element is, what are the core values of your company? Or maybe they're the foundational, I should say. So at the bottom, what is it that your company does to help people? What is it that you do to solve whatever problem it is um, that's out there? What do you bring to the table? So what is it that your company does? That's the first part of your value proposition. The second part of the value proposition, uh, the second distinct value, is what does it mean to work with, with me? What does it mean to work with you, the individual? So you, when you are facing a client or a prospect, what is it that you, the person, not the company, what is it that you bring to the table? Each of us are experts in our own industry, but the person across the hall might be working for a company and an expert in another industry. Their value proposition will be different from yours. Okay, so what is it that you do? What's your value proposition? So the first is the company, the second is you. And then the third aspect of the value proposition is what is it that you can do for that specific client? So how is it 
You've heard uh, just about everybody mention their pain points. What is it that they're challenged with? How can you help solve that? So what is it that you can do for the individual that you're talking to in the moment right now? So my company, working with me personally, and what can I do to help you as an individual or as a company? So if you give that some thought and you can think of three discrete uh, portions of that, 10 seconds for each, and you got yourself a 30 second elevator pitch, no problem. Okay, so, so again, we've got a couple different perspectives. I wanted to share one other thing with you with regard to value propositions. How many of you in this room uh, sell the least cost product or service in your space? <coughs> no one. Everyone, how many of you have the most expensive product in your space? Mostly in between. Oh, I've got one. Okay. So if I were to stand here in front of you and I had two ice cream cones, both chocolate ice cream, both sitting on a sugar cone, and one of them was 50 cents, and the other one was $2. Which one would you buy? <coughs> Which one? How many of you would buy the 50 cents one? Why wouldn't you buy the $2 one? You don't see the difference. Why, why don't you see a difference? Well, you're not tasting it anymore. Nothing's happened yet, right? Now, if I, if I had one that said 50 cents, and it was an Acme, a uh, chocolate cone, and the other one was a haagen chocolate cone. Now you have to make a decision. Is there enough value in that haagen ice cream for me to spend $2 versus 50 cents for the Acme brand? I mean, if you recognize the brand, then if, yeah. If you recognize the brand. the brand, right. then maybe not. Maybe not, right? But generally speaking, what, what's the difference? The difference is that we have now imparted some value, additional value, in the haagen or the haagen versus the Acme as being worthy of our additional monies. And I think that's what I, I was hearing. You know, we've got to be able to differentiate ourselves in the marketplace. Our value proposition has to differentiate us in some way. And we've got to connect with that client in a way to make them able to want to spend more money with us or separate us at least from the competition. And that's what a value proposition does. It helps to separate us from competition. But we're all not out there every day doing all the selling for our business or the company or the bank or the institution we work for. We have to sometimes bring in other people to do that work for us. So if I'm a business owner, a manager, uh, an executive, and I need to bring in a new person, the question for the panel then is how do I identify the right person to bring in for my business? Who's the right person? How do I identify that? So, I think it's to Andrew, is it? Andrew. <clears throat> How do I identify the right person? Okay, again, it's a process. And uh, we actually have a folder that has 15 or 16 points that we go through. So, we advertise, we get resumes in, we're very good at screening resumes. Then we have a phone interview that is 10 questions, the same 10 questions. We ask the 10 questions to make a determination if this is somebody we're going to want to spend more time with. If we do, we bring them in. We have a 20 question questionnaire that we go through in detail. Then if we're still interested in having this person, we have them come back, meet for a third time, have, take a personality profile that takes and has them answer 100 something questions on a computer that matches their personality with people that have been very successful in our industry in sales. Um, after we get a look at the profile, the three people that have interviewed this individual confer, we have the person go out for half a day in the field with one of our salespeople, and they experience what a half a day looks like, and they ask the other salesperson questions, and they get insight to the business, and they go on appointments, and they make cold calls. We call their references. We don't skip references. We do background checks on individuals. We make sure that I've made every mistake under the sun in hiring people in my industry. And even with going through all these checks and balances, the amount of time and effort that we put into training these individuals, there's no guarantee that they'll succeed. Um, but our goal is to hire the right individual for the job and have it be a win-win, a win for them, win for us, not waste time, not waste money, and have a high degree of certainty that they could work out and provide for themselves and provide for the company. Great. 
Danny. Sure. I think first thing is uh, don't settle. You know, a lot of times we need to fill a seat. <coughs> need somebody, need a salesperson, and, you know, and we just kind of don't go through the steps. And appreciate that very honest answer that you go through all these steps, and, and it's still not a perfect science. But uh, you want to do things to uh, find out as much as you can. We have what we call the search model. Uh, what are the skills? You really have to think about what the skills you want somebody to, to possess. What are the experiences they should have, have had? Uh, certainly uh, attitudes and results and, and cognitive skills and habits. So you want, you want to figure all those things out. What are the must-haves? What are the should-haves? What are the nice-to-haves? And um, we also have a, a, a uh, pretty extensive uh, phone interview. Actually, it's, uh, what you want to do is treat somebody if, uh, the way that you would as if you were a buyer. Instead of saying, hey, Paul, we have a great organization, you know, we got, you know, the seven of us are here, and it's like a family, you know, and, you know, we, we, we really enjoy being with each other, and you'll like it too. You know, what you want to do is actually put the salesperson on the spot. Hey, Paul, you know, we've got 60 resumes here. We've <coughs> very, uh, a lot of action based on, on, this, on this position. Uh, I'm going to have a few questions for you. You can have some for me, and at the end of this uh, 15 minutes, we'll see if we should keep speaking. You okay with that? So you want to see what a person is like because when you call a prospect, they don't say, well, hey, how you doing? I wasn't doing anything. Come Let's on. talk, right? Come on in. That's good. So, so you want to hear what somebody's <coughs> like, and a lot of times people say, no, no, I have my assistant have the people come in, and then we interview them here. I mean, I've had people tell me I could smell it, Dan. I could, I, I could tell. I mean, oh, my God, that's a recipe for disaster. So, you know, you want to, you wanna, there's a little rating system that you would use in, in order to, in order to um, do they try and close you at the end of the meeting? Well, you know what? I'll call you next week. Somebody says, you want me to steal third or I'm out of time? I don't know. Okay. okay. So, um, uh, all right. So anyway, so, so and then, uh, you know, you, you want to rate that and you also um, want to certainly do some kind of uh, evaluation, online assessment as, as part of the evaluation, right? Great, thanks, Dan. Mm -hmm. yep. You're safe. <laughs> All right, thanks. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, a slightly different perspective. Not every business out there is going to have the resources and means to do um, full wholesale, wholesale screening on each individual candidate. <coughs> um, while they are effective tools and powerful tools, I think that they apply really well to sales organizations. A lot of individuals out here are not necessarily true sales professionals and might not have those type of tools or resources at your disposal. So uh, some of the things I think that you should look for or be uh, aware of would be, uh, do they have passion? And it doesn't have to be necessarily passion for your business, but are they, what are they passionate about? Do they have a passion for the business um, or for something else? Because you can always tie that passion into something else. But if they're kind of a, a slow, lazy, sluggish individual and there's not much <coughs> passion in them, period, and maybe they're not going to be a good fit for you. So maybe they're passionate about cars, whatever it may be. They have passion for something. Those are the types of individuals that make good candidates because you can tie that passion back to something else. Um, do the values of those candidates match the values of your business? So if you're an environmental firm and you want to have a very little uh, carbon footprint or a positive green impact, do they share those values too? Or are they driving a giant gas guzzler to work and it's not going to necessarily look good when they show up in front of your prospects and clients? So do they share similar passions? Do they like giving back? Are you a charitable organization? Whatever it may be. And then lastly, uh, willingness to learn. So if you hire somebody who's got passion and they share the same values, call Sandler. Call Corporate Ladders. They can be taught. There, there are ways you can teach them skills, but are they willing to learn? the way you do things. So passion, willingness to learn, and shared values, I think, are three things that make up a really good professional. The rest, you can teach them along the way. Okay, Michelle? I have a little bit of a different approach. Um, so the surveys and all that stuff is really great, but I'm kind of more of a hands-on. So we don't, our industry is a little bit different. We don't have a huge sales force. Um, so I'm kind of like old school. I like the people to come in. I like to see. I want to, I put myself in that situation. I'm like, okay, if they were selling to me, why would I buy something from them? So let's be candid, right? You want your sales professionals to look professional. You're not going to hire somebody or I'm not going to hire somebody who comes in in sweatpants. 
it's probably not going to happen. I'm not going to come uh, hire somebody necessarily who doesn't really fit the culture of our organization. So if they come in and they're complaining <coughs> when I first meet them, or they're saying, oh my gosh, this is terrible, or I hate sales. Well, obviously it's probably not going to be a good fit because we want somebody, again, you want to know your, you want to know your product, which is teachable, but you want to, passion is definitely something. You want somebody to be personable, right? Can you have a conversation? Do you dress neatly? You don't have to have a $4,000 suit on, but know that you come in with pride. You're going to represent the organization. They're all companies, a family-owned company, even though there's over 300 employees, they're very involved. So we talk about quality, efficiency, integrity. We want to know that that person's going to represent our culture. I want to know that the person that I'm hiring to do sales for me for Pure Soil is going to, provide, is going to go with our mindset, service, performance, results. We want to be um, strategic. We want to make sure that person has some knowledge. <coughs> in, in our industry, it's helpful if you have some type of industry knowledge. So the sales portion of it uh, is one thing. Um, having some industry background is another thing, um, but it's also about personality, perception, uh, having that conversation. If somebody's looking in my eyes when I'm talking to them or they're looking around the room, it's probably not somebody that I'm going to put out there um, saying, okay, they're going to represent our company and they're going to sell for us. So th that would be my takeaway. Okay, so we heard that passion obviously is a piece of this, a process. Uh, the sense of being able to make a good connected appearance when you uh, arrive for an interview, the person that you're going to look at sort of resonates that they understand what's going on. Uh, and in Andrew's case, they've got the, the, the uh, benefit of a historic uh, profile of the types of individuals that fit. Uh, in the case of what Danny said, he can help you to develop a profile for folks that, that might be a good fit. So I think there are a lot of different perspectives uh, uh, as finding the right kind of person that matches up with your organization. So that pretty much takes care of the, the formal number of questions that we had today. Uh, I wanted to uh, leave the rest of our time to open it up to you in the audience with questions for the panel. And uh, perhaps something came up during the course of the morning uh, that was of interest and we might want to explore that a little bit further. So uh, anyone, please give us a hand. Yes. Yes, so uh, three things that uh, was, were not addressed. I'd be interested in knowing your thoughts on using social media and the internet to market and build a business. The second is I'd like to hear your approach on the cold call. And the third is I'd like to hear your approach or views on mail, internet mail, uh, emailing and cold emailing. Okay, so there's three questions. <coughs> uh, why don't I give one to each of the panelists? So who would like to take the question on social media? No, okay. Okay. Uh, let me just hold it. The next one was a question. The question cold was going cold to call. cold calling. Was the second. Uh, Danny, would take that one. Sure. Okay. And the third was and cold email. And the third was cold email. Okay. I'll take that. And one. then we'll come back for for a question for you. Sure. Okay. Good. All right. So. Uh, Let's try to make a truncated, maybe a one Certainly. One minute. Um, I think that social media is what um, everyone is telling you is critical to success nowadays. Um, my beliefs is that it, it, everything has its own place. Um, for some businesses, uh, what, what's your business? I'm in, yeah, I'm in the investment business. You're in the investment. Business. Okay. So if you're looking <coughs> for um, straight up consumers, it might be effective, it might be impactful, and you, there's a lot that you can do as far as um, building up sort of an organic grassroots, developing a follower base, always posting articles, publishing, sharing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't personally believe that you're gonna close a deal through social media or online, but it's gonna do great work for your marketing, okay? Um, now, if you are, uh, a few gentlemen I spoke to this morning, one of their kids is into collectible sneakers and makes a small, pro a, a nice profit selling collectible sneakers. Social media can be an outstanding tool for something like that. So I think just knowing your business is really critical for that. Cool. And with uh, cold calling? Yeah, sure. So uh, first of all, cold calling is not dead. I think a lot of people, when they see the press on it, they're like, oh, yeah, thank God it is. I read it, so I don't have to do it. But the fact is that um, you know, if you do pick up the phone, it is the most direct way to try and get with someone. Now, we have strategies for how do you get return voicemails as well. You know, because a lot of times people say, hey, you know what? It's just going to be a voicemail anyway, you know, which becomes head trash. And really what I'm in is in the head trash removal business, right? So I could talk now about 
the technique of it, but we first have to overcome the head trash of it and picking it up. But what we want to do is, is actually do the opposite of what a traditional salesperson would do. Typically, someone calls, hey, it's Danny Wood, sound the training. How are you today? Right? So, boom, we know that's a salesperson. But hey, it's Danny Wood. I uh, don't know if my name rings a bell. Uh, d- does my name ring a bell to you? Actually, no, Dan, I, it doesn't. Should I know you? I mean, things happen because we're interrupting the pattern. No, no, we've never met. Hey, don't know if we need to be speaking. And if you want to even just say, hey, you know what, I'm uncomfortable making this call. I'm an investment <coughs> banker. I'm not a salesperson. But I thought it, it may be important for us to speak. Would it be all right if I told you why I called? You be the judge and jury on that. You let me know if you want to, if you want to continue speaking. Good, honest, pattern interrupt, no pressure. Give them the choice and then have a 30-second commercial that has the pains in it so that somebody can relate at the end. I, we help people with pain A, pain B, pain C, but I, I don't want to assume for a moment that that would be relevant in your business. And let them say, well, well you know, quite frankly, uh, number two. And then you just sit back. Well, well, why number two? So, you know, if they say, well, none of those, can I ask you a question? It sounds like it'll be a short call, just a research question. Nobody's perfect, not even us. If there was one thing that they could be doing better, even if it was once in a while, what would it be? Or so it's just these honest questions so that you don't appear like you're a salesperson. Good. Mm-hmm. Good. Andrew, I'm going to take the last one. Yeah, I'm going to address all three for two seconds on each. Uh, social media, we spend a thousand bucks a month on social media, and if we measure our return on investment, it's very, very low. It's a negative return on investment, but we do it. We believe the millennials are big in social media. As far as cold calling, we do in-person cold calling, we do phone cold calling, and we get business from it. The numbers are 50 cold calls, three possibilities, one or two presentations. So it's a matter of how much rejection. You, you, the numbers work. They always work and hold true, but we get large customers from cold calling very large customers from cold calling. Email marketing, I get 100 emails a day. I have three hours a day that I clear emails. It drives me nuts. I try and get rid of the junk emails and the emails of solicitation instantaneously. I can't handle it. I I waste too much time with it. I have important things that I have to answer. I have things I have to open, look at, can't address right now, have to mark it unread and go back to it later. I print things out that I have to read because somebody wrote me a five paragraph email. We don't email market anymore. We did in the beginning, we don't anymore. What we do is we send letters, personal letters of introduction to people. We hand address the outside of the envelope and we write personal and confidential in the lower right hand corner of the envelope. And in the introduction letter, we say who we are, why we're reaching out to them, and then we're gonna follow up in a four, di- three to four or five days from now to set up a possible get together. We find that with mail in an office, you have junk mail, receptionist gets the mail, all the mail comes in a big box. Junk mail goes into the garbage. The bills go to accounting, the checks go to accounting. Correspondence, depending on the company, can o- get open, but if it's marked personal and confidential, it gets to the individual. When we follow up with a phone call, we tell the receptionist, This person is expecting a call from us because we're saying it in the letter and we make the phone calls and we follow up. If we don't make those phone calls in the next three, four days, we've already failed at the first promise that we've made. We are looking to make a contact, introduce ourselves, and we are making a commitment that we're going to call. If we call, we start (coughs) the trust. And it's something that a lot of companies, they want to buy something, they make phone calls. They can't even get people on the phone. So that's how we get and prospect and find business uh, besides physical cold calls, phone cold calls, networking, um, asking for referrals. Great. Uh, Michelle, do you want to jump on that? Any? any I do, actually, if you don't mind. A couple things, and really quick and brief. Social media, great branding, right? Millennials, that's all they do. How do presidents get elected? (coughs) Social media. Uh, cold calling, I think, works. Uh, you know, you have to know what you're, you're, who you're talking to and what your target market is. Um, but typically, make it brief, right? Because I know when I get a cold call, I have very little time. So, you know, you have your, like, two seconds and then ask me if I want to continue the conversation or, you know, if we could set up a time, if it's convenient. I, in my industry, I'll say sometimes uh, I call people, they're in the field. I always say to them, is, did I catch you at a bad time? It kind of takes them, like, off guard. And then they're like, 
oh yeah, actually it's not really a good time, but could you call me back in an hour? I'm waiting for a truck to come or this. Or sometimes they're like, no, actually I have a minute. I'm just uh, going back to my office. I just finished lunch. Totally sets a different tone. As for uh, emailing, I wanna say it's a very minimal use of my time. It doesn't cost me a lot. So if I send out an email blast for constant contact, <coughs> I wanna say if it takes me two seconds or it has my staff do it, if I get one or two customers a month or a year, it, it's more that one or two more customers than I had before. Okay. So that's my takeaway. Thank you. Take Thank you. I, we have time for one or two more questions. Yes. There's uh, something I always struggled with. I came from the insurance industry before I'm in this position now. And I always had a conflict of how often am I touching the customers I currently have, like even a number percentage wise, and how often should I be going after new business? Because I know you get a lot of business from your current customers when it comes to referrals, but a lot of times I feel like there is a number almost, like a 75, 25, or depending on what industry you're in, of how often you should be reaching out for new customers or concentrating on the guys you already have. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, anyone? So in your cookbook, you, what you would want to have is uh, how many new people a week you're looking to reach out to and how many existing uh, people you're looking to reach out to. So uh, we call it uh, your minimal daily behavior. So you want to make sure you do your minimal daily behavior every day. So as busy as you are doing everything else that you need to do. Um, so, so for me, I might have... Uh, you know, let's say 15 new contacts for me for, for doing what I'm doing. And by the way, what you want to do is, is not just calls, but how many conversations do you want to have? Because if you just do calls, hey, I did 60 calls, which I don't do. I'd rather have 15, uh, you know, three conversations with the right person each day. That's a good day. Three conversations, you know, good things are going to happen. But maybe you want to have two conversations each day with an existing client, but not somebody who you spoke to yesterday, but I think if you speak to everybody you know, every few weeks or every month or so, I think you'd be, how's it going? Checking, you know, checking in. And by the way, checking in and just calling, I try and use, not use the word just, because just means I'm, uh, I'm kind of, you know, it's just me, you know, interrupting you for something that I want that, uh, you know, you're too busy to give me. So I try to not be, I think it's a wimpy word, but hey, I'm, I, thinking of you, want to see how you're doing, anything I can help you with. I think people can appreciate that. Good. Anybody want to add to that? Yeah. Uh, number one, you can always ask people, how often would you like me to stay in touch with you and follow up and check in and see how things are going? Um, <clears throat> but we actually have a formula, of course. We have our A clients, and our A clients is what they purchased or have the propensity to purchase from us. And those people we contact or visit once a month, our B clients, large clients, once every quarter, our average clients, we stay in touch with through a visit or call once every six months. Our D clients, once a year. And we actually have E clients, people we never call because they weren't great clients, but we'll do business with them if they call again. Um, but it, according to the Harvard Business Review, if you are a great company, tremendous company, you great, give good value, you provide great services, you're still going to lose 15% of your customer base every year. So if you're not out prospecting and generating 25 new clients a year, you're shrinking. Uh, if you want to grow, the goal is to grow. Our goal is to grow 10% each year. We've got to find 25 new prospects for every one of our sales territories so we grow. And so prospecting is a regular part of our selling. My salespeople are not just farmers. Yes, they take care of their clients. They grow business in their clients. They ask for referrals. They try and grow the business high, deep, and wide. High meaning that they work with everybody in the company, going right up through the president. Wide, everybody around the person they do business with. Uh, I mean, deep and wide is if they have other locations around, we want to know about those locations because if we have a competitor going into those locations and they're going wide, they're trying to take our clients away. So that's us being a farmer. Being a hunter, we want to go out and find new future clients. Retail, retail reps, they sit in an office waiting for people to come or in a showroom waiting for people to come. Biggest mistake is they have to be marketers and they have to be going out and finding new clients also, not just waiting for things to happen. Okay, good. Uh, we have time for one more question. Anyone? Okay, well, very good. I want to thank the panel for, for their time this morning, Michelle and Andrew and uh, Danny and Bill. Uh, excellent job, panel. Thank you. I want to thank you all for coming.